you need people around you that are going to look after you for the right reasons and not for your money or for the wrong reasons of being seen out and look at me, look who I'm with and taking advantage. I, I, I'd admit it, I'm a fiery character. I, I wanted to win all the time. I never, losing for me was not acceptable. I didn't, I hated losing. I mean, I, I cried when I played, I cried because of sometimes I'd let myself down, but I'd let my family down. So I knew in them situations, but did it, did it ever like affect me by the way I needed to be? No, because I knew that I needed to release the negativity out of my own body. Paul Robinson, welcome to the Christie Scanlon podcast. Uh, my first question, Paul, is how did your football career start? Um, started from a young age, really. I mean, I was four or five when I wanted to kick a football around with my brother and my dad in the garden. Not a very big garden, nice small one. So it was, uh, it was good for me to test my skills out. Um, and then I sort of went into the sort of the Watford Academy at the age of nine. So, yeah, started from a young age, really. And who was your influences growing up? You mentioned Watford Academy. Were you a supporter? Did you have other influences in terms of parents, et cetera, as well? Yeah, obviously, my mum and my dad were very supportive of me growing up as a kid, my brother, my sister. Um, and then my mates that I used to play on the streets with, they was always sort of wanting me to go down that route because they could see I had something about me where they knew that I possibly later on in life could go on and, and, and do things. Um, obviously, when you go through school system, the teachers were always very supportive. So, yeah, I had I always had that great support growing up as a kid. Of, but, it, but for me, it was always about me, myself. I knew I had to do it. No one else could do it for me. It was all about me doing it. You said then that you, there was always something about you. What, what do you think made you a successful footballer? Or even to have a career within football, what, what, what do you think that thing was? I sort of had that determination, that grip between my teeth, that no one was going to stop me. Um, obviously, I never... Academically at school, I was never very switched on with it. I didn't feel it was me. Um, all I wanted to do was play football. So that was always on the back burner, lessons and, and doing my exams, even though I, I just scraped through. But just scraping through nowadays is not enough. You need to, you need to be fully concentrating. You need to work hard. Um, but back then, it wasn't, it wasn't like that. It was, right, I want to be a footballer. That's all I had in my head. So I knew I had that mentality. That was, that was my mentality was, is that, I want to. I want to be a professional football player, right? How do I become that? That was in the streets late at night, playing on the on the um, on the on the roads with my mates, um, going to parks, um, just staying up late. Obviously, you go through the academy and you learn different skills, but it was twice a week. It wasn't five times a week like it is now. So yeah, I I felt that I had that tough upbringing that I that I needed that put me in good stead later on in life. How important yeah. is sacrifice to to achieve anything in in maybe life? Because I think especially with football, it's glamorised and we see the outcome of, of performance. But how important is sacrifice to to actually achieve playing or even, you know, winning honours, etc., representing countries? How, how important is that yeah, in terms of that important. process? You have to sacrifice what, what you where do you want to go? What do you want to do in your life? Um, for me, it's, it's, no, it's no different to any other job. So you have to give sacrifices up of where you want to get to, how high do you want to go, the things you need to do. But respectfully, you need to do them respectfully. So for me, it was always about I need to earn the right. So as a footballer, I've got to earn. I've got to earn the shirt. I've got to earn the right to play on the team. So it was about working hard, um, and I had that. I had that in abundance. Was if I was left out, it wasn't about moaning. Yeah, you'd have your your little say every now and then, but I'd get on the training ground and I'd work hard. I'd go in and do my individual stuff after as well, and work hard on that on what I needed to do to be better. So there was always a lot of sacrifice for me. Um, being away from the family, that's hard enough, is that when you've got kids growing up, you've got to sacrifice that you're going to be travelling. You're not going to see your family as much as what you like. Christmas, you're not going to spend time with them at Christmas. So there is, there's loads of sacrifices that you look over your career or look over your life to where I am now. And I missed out on a lot of family time because of my, my job and what I wanted to do and, and how I wanted to achieve it as a, as a player. I wanted to be an example, should you say. I want... Like for me now, it's I want to be that example as a player when I was getting older and I saw the youngsters coming through. I had to be that example. I had to be the role model of this is what you need to do. This is the standards you need to set to get to hopefully have the career that I had. So, yeah, there's always there's always sacrifices that need to be made. So you've played over 700 games. So how do you maintain such a long career? How do you develop longevity? Just looking after your body, doing the right things. 
knowing that there is a time when you can let your hair down and relax. There's you have to you you got to you got to switch off. You got to be able to do other things that that people would probably don't like you doing, which is going out for a drink, relaxing with your mates, or going to play golf. Just hobbies, other hobbies to switch off from from the intensity of football. So yeah, right. I, I always looked after myself. Like you say, I always did the extra bits. I never cut corners. Everything for me was yes, okay. You you were going to do certain things that people. I want to be better than him, so I would go over the line to get there, and I would do things that would push my body out of my comfort zone. That you used to think, well, Jesus, I, I didn't know I could do that. That was the thing with me is that your mind works in different ways, and if you don't try it and you don't push yourself, how are you ever going to know that you can get to that level? I get the sense that it's very much psychologically rather than physically in terms yeah. of your your longevity. There, how important yeah. is mindset within elite performance? Mindsets it's very very important in my in my eyes. You've got to be you've got to be fully focused. You've got to be concentrated. You've got to be determined. So yeah, for me, it's important that you use your head and you think you think you think the correct way. That's what you need to do. You need to think mm -hmm. smart. Obviously, in in terms of elite performance now, there's a lot of distraction. There's a lot of discipline needed. Um, how do how did you cope with maybe the pressures of playing football? I didn't have a lot of social media when I was growing up. So that was mm. a plus point. No camera yeah. phones. So so for me, yeah, that was no gamings. So you was never online against your mates or like till the early hours of the morning. So I always had things that are around now that you can see are a distraction for the younger generation. I never had that. So that was good for me because I knew that I could fully focus on my games where I needed to be. So, yeah, I just think that, that sort of that social media side of it is, I think, again, is important. You, if you're on, if you're on these pages for followers, or you're on these pages to mo promote it, then that's fair enough. But if you can't handle the negativity that's going to come your way, then don't go on it. Mm -hmm. So, I could, I could deal with that. I could deal with the negativity and and, and the positivity because that's the that's that's the greatness of the of the sport is that everyone has an opinion and everyone deserves their their say. So. Yeah, I'll I'll love the praise, but I also love the negativity because mm. they were never going to change me as a person, no matter what they felt about me. Did you ever have the well, did you have the mindset of when maybe negativity come towards you, you were determined to maybe prove people wrong, or was yeah, it? Yeah, one hundred. Did you just did you just block that? I, I'm again just trying to get your your viewpoint on how you dealt with that process of of pressure uh, and ne dealing with maybe external yeah. people. Negativity inspired me inspired me to prove people wrong it's like all right you can you can say that but you've never tried it you've never done what i've tried to do you've never put your body through what i've put my body through so you can sit behind a screen and you can write your comments but i'm the one that's going above and beyond to get to the levels that i want to get to so i know i'm going to make mistakes everybody makes mistakes in life we all make mistakes it's how do you bounce back from them and i was always mentally strong enough to move on from the from the errors that I made and learn from them because that's what it's all about. It's about learning from the mistakes that you make. Just just reflecting on what you've said, especially around psychological aspects, mental health is a big topic within football currently. Mm. How do you think that the game has adapted or changed in relation to this area in comparison to maybe when you were playing and to maybe your role as a coach today? I think it still can be better. The mental health side of it's obviously it's it's, it's a difficult subject to sometimes touch on. Um, but I feel that, that there's more people speaking up about it now, which is great. Whereas before in, in football, you couldn't. You couldn't really talk about it. If you was if you spoke that you were feeling not the best, you'd always get battered by teammates or by other people saying you're weak. You're not weak. It's not weakness. It's, it's emotions. Your body has emotions that you need to release and energy. <laughs> so you have to be able to let go of that. And if you're not feeling good within yourself then you need to talk to someone you need to speak up about it and yeah for me it that it needs to be it needs to be more it definitely needs to be more because it's such a pressurized sport now failure if if you're failing then where's that help where's that someone to put their arm around your shoulder where's that one to give you encouragement where's that someone to get you back to the levels that they know that you can get to but you're obviously going through a tough time at the moment so yeah, I always believe that there's there should be more in the in the game to help you. But I do I do think it's getting so much better now. I do think the clubs now are seeing it and they're supporting it and they're getting things in the right place to help these players get through certain situations. Mm. Again, it's interesting. I, I can imagine from an outsider looking in. Again, football very masculine in its ways. You mentioned emotions, sensitivity, mm. um, 
unveiling emotional aspects within yourself as an individual as well as performer yeah. um why do you think that is an issue within football as a whole especially male dominated environments why do you think that is that is an issue around opening up and talking about pressures or other external factors because it's seen as weakness isn't it it's like as a, as a, as a teammate sometimes if someone's mentally stronger and they can deal with them pressures other people can't some people can't deal with that pressure some people find it too much, too much negativity, too much like in the intensity of it. Like it could lead to your family. Your family then get affected by it because you're not in a good place. So it's it's being able to support them people, being able to talk to them, being able to help them go through it. Even managers, managers need to, they need to be supportive of certain players that will go through things. They need to be a shoulder to cry on. I mean, I, I cried when I played, I cried because of sometimes I'd let myself down, but I'd let my family down. So I knew in them situations, but did it did it ever like affect me by the way I needed to be? No, because I knew that I needed to release the negativity out of my own body. Did you ever see a psychologist during your career? No, no, I never. I never felt like I needed to see a psychologist. It wasn't within me. It was even though I sort of think differently or acted the way that I wanted to act. It was my own emotions and my own ways. I mean, my wife's a professional acupuncturist, so she helps stick some needles in me to make me feel a little bit better as well, which is great. So, but yeah, I, but I always had that support with me. I always had that support system around me as well, where I knew I could turn to certain people and they would help me and get me through it. So I think Hold that's up. key. I think the friendship, I think the friendship circle is very important and you're not, You've not got people around you are, who are also taking advantage of you. You need, when you're playing in this sport, you need people around you that are going to look after you for the right reasons and not for your money or for the wrong reasons of being seen out and look at me, look who I'm with and taking advantage. I think we see a lot of that. I think we see a lot of that in football, especially with the younger kids now. Paul, I mean, I'm intrigued even by speaking to you over the last 10 to 15 minutes your mindset and your element of leadership within football how did you develop that is, is that something that you've nurtured or is that natural to you or how have you developed those traits as a professional I think obviously you pick pieces up from the people that you've worked with over the years obviously Graham Taylor was a was a big personality for me growing up as a kid like he was my mentor I had Kenny Jacket was my youth team manager and then my first team manager at Watford uh, Jimmy Gilligan, um, John McDermott, who's now with the English FA. So I had good Tom Wally. Um, I had real good people around me who were that bulk and they they talked to me the right way. They give me toughness. They give me like that, that pathway to go on and go, right, we're giving you now the guidance to go on and do it. They also communicated to me. So they always spoke to me going, Paul, that's not right. You shouldn't be doing that. Or Paul, that's great. Keep working on that. So I always had that guidance. So my leadership then at that young age, obviously I wanted to not only play football, but then on, later on when you're thinking about it, when you go through the coaching, you've got to have that leadership. You've got to, players now are going to look up to you and they're going to say, well, you had that great career. So I want to feed off you. I want to learn off you. I want to pick up bits and pieces of what you did so I can take into my game. Even as a coach today at Millwall, do you think mm. leadership's changed since when you were playing or is there still similar traits just in terms of traits. Yeah. yeah, still similar traits. Obviously, the game's changing the way it is. I mean, the, the, the technique, the quality, the sports science. So it's it's always changing every year. So there's always something different, but it's adapting. There's people we have to adapt. We have to learn. If we stay in the old ways, then it's no good because mm. everyone's moving on. So we have to move on. I have to evolve as a coach. I have to understand the players I'm working with, not only the senior ones, but the younger ones. I can give the senior ones a little bit more hardness and toughness about them because... They've been around the block a little bit. But with the younger ones, it's guidance, it's encouragement. You're going to make a mistake. Don't worry about it. Get on with it. Don't keep thinking about it because the more you think about it, the more mistakes you're going to make. So for me, it was always, you have to use that psychology with them as well. So you have to put them in a good place. But because I picked up bits and pieces off people over the years, I can then pass it on to them as well as what I learned as a player and within myself of how I could deal with my situations that I was going through, not only as a player, but as a coach. Mm. How, how do you deal with maverick players then? Someone who is a bit egotistic or someone that is a, a very, very good player, but might need a little bit of a push or a, a little bit of a kick up the backside. How would you deal with, with maybe different personalities in the dressing room or 
as a player, but also as well as a, as a maybe as a, as a coach and a manager? How, how would you deal with those different characters and different types of, of people? You have to find the balance. So you have to you have to get that right balance. Yes, you are going to get mavericks at football clubs. You understand that. But there's a way that you can deal with them. You can give them loving when they need the loving. But then you can also give them that time where you go, oi, come on, you're a real good player, but you are actually letting yourself down now with what you're doing. So you have to give them that realism of how far do you how far do you want to go as a player? Because that can only get you there, but then that can get you higher because now you're thinking and you're using your brain a lot more. So you have to find the balance. You have to. How did you find retirement from from football? Obviously, large career in terms of longevity. Yeah. Was it was it difficult to adjust after? Um, I'd have spells, but I also did my my transition for me was probably the best way that I could have done it was I did my coaching before I retired. So I went and took younger groups at Birmingham. Um, I went and watched certain games. So, so for me, when I knew then that I was retiring, I had that little bit of a balance was, right, I know I'm going to go into my coaching, so I've worked on that. And now I can focus on now, yes, I'm still on the grass, but I'm doing it in a different role. I'm doing it now where I'm coaching and I'm trying to pass on my information. So my transition for me was, yeah, was really good. But I do, I have spells when I'm playing games now, I get that buzz. I miss it. I miss the atmosphere. I miss kicking people. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, only, only joking about one. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I. But you do, you because it's in you. It's. It's. I love. I love the game. I love the sport. It gives you that buzz. It's what you've done for so long, and it, and it wouldn't be the same if you just left it all behind. That's not me. It's. Mm. So yeah, well, I do get that buzz every now and then when I play in games and when I um sort of have a kick around with the football and that. I get that little bit of a. I probably get a little bit too excited and then. <laughs> get a little bit carried away with certain things in training yeah. yeah i don't want to embarrass the lads too much though in training that's the problem <laughs> you, you mentioned the um, the emotional element yeah. I, I presume you're very emotional when you play mm. and, and, and in terms of maybe controlling that yeah. intelligence is have you got an on off switch Do you, have you learned how to deal with maybe emotional intelligence as a coach now yeah i have now i have now is that been a challenge Paul. Yeah, of course it has. Of course it has, because I'm fiery. I, I, I'd admit it, I'm a fiery character. I, I wanted to win all the time. I never, losing for me, it was not acceptable. I didn't, I hated losing. You, if you tried to speak to me after the game, I'd be grumpy. I wouldn't speak to my missus or my kids. I'd just go in and just go, yeah, not, yeah, no good. Don't talk to me. So that's, that was the way I had to deal with that. Um, obviously in games, if someone was annoying me in a game and the teams were taking the mick a little bit, you, you'd want that, come on, like, let's, these are taking the mick out of us. We need to get about them a little bit more. So I always then had to find that switch of, yeah, but you've got to be careful now because you're on a yellow card. You have to find that balance. But sometimes that balance, it's like a roller coaster, isn't it? Your emotions are always up and down. It's, it's just trying to get it in the middle so you're not going over the top, but you're also collectively calm and you're focusing on your game. In terms of maybe big big occasions, then for for example, derby matches against maybe Aston Villa or yeah or the fixtures, does that kind of impact players then in terms of the build up and the atmosphere and the fans? Does that does that get to players or do you have to kind of control that that aspect of just keeping calm and remembering it's another game? How, how do you deal with that situation? They're, they're situations they're very hard to deal with, especially when it's like a local derby because, like you say, you get the whole atmosphere. It's special. It's your local mm. rivals, right? I need to be up for this one, but I but I need to be not too up for it. So I can, I, my adrenaline's going to get me through it just because of the occasion that we're planning. But we've also got to have a calmness about us. So you would, you would communicate to players, you'd speak to players, you'd make sure you see the ones that are getting a little bit over the top. You're like, relax, just relax, let your game do the talking. Because once you're once you, once you're gone, that's your game then got out the window because you're mm. too worried about the atmosphere then instead of just focus on your game. Focus on what you need to do as a player. Have that call, that calm control about you and stop worrying about the emotions that are going on around you and you're getting now carried away with what's going on over there in the crowd or, oh, I can see something happening in the corner there. Or this player now, he's getting starting to get a little bit agitated and starting to wind me up a little bit. You just have to take a deep breath sometimes and just mm -hmm. relax and just focus on, right, I just need to stay in the game here and keep calm. Where were you happiest in, in your career? Um, I was definitely happiest at Watford and West Brom. They were my happy times. I don't, and that's not that's no disrespect to all the other clubs. I loved all the other clubs I loved playing at, but my best football 
And my best my best times of my career were growing up at Watford and coming through the academy and then making my first team debut and winning promotions. And then uh, the same was at West Brom. I went on then to, to West Brom and we won things. And yeah, I, I mean, that was... I probably played my best football when I was at West Brom. That was... They were my best times of my footballing career, yeah. Why were they your best then? You mentioned honours and success. Was that yeah, just a, a key factor? The group of, yeah, the group of players I played with, we all had the same mentality. Um, we won. We were winners. We won We won promotions. We we got far in, in cup competitions. So we would push each other. And that's that's what competition's all about. It's like later on, as, as I was getting older, the, the players that were coming through were younger, but also... They they weren't on my level of where I was at before or the players that I played with, and that was that wasn't being disrespectful to them. That was just of these is what I'd done at, over my career at that time and what I'd won, and I don't see that now with the way the game's going and the way the way the players are. Hmm. But they were all great lads. I loved it. I love working with every single individual that I work with because everyone's different, totally different characters, and people people will play the game differently to what I was. But it was just them times for me were the most happiest and the, and the stuff that I enjoyed winning. Spoke to David Cottrell a few months back and he mentioned the the changes in management um, at Birmingham impacted him as a player. Yes. Was that something that impacted you in terms of being a leader uh, and being responsible for an, a number of players in, in terms of maybe changes in leadership and owners and the impact of maybe business factors noise from outside how, yeah. how did that impact you as a player I think as a player you, you you can't worry too much about what goes on with the managers or with the ownership I mean I, I know I said bits before in the past it, for me it's about stability owners who own the clubs they have the right they spend their money so they they have to make tough decisions whether that's sacking a manager whether that's making random decisions on players of what they want to do with them that's totally up to them it, for me, it's key is what I, I had to lead the dressing room. So if there was new players coming in, if there was old players still there, if there was players coming in more money, you always have to think of the different scenarios that are going to happen in football. And it's you, you can't worry about that. You, mm -hmm. you can't focus on what anyone else is doing. If the manager changes, lads, yeah, OK, we might be disappointed with it, but we've got a new manager coming in now and we have to support him. We have to back him. We have to, un we have to understand that he's going to be different and he's going to want to play a different way. He might play different players and different. That's what we have to do. We get paid to do that. So that's our job. We get paid to do it. So we have to get on with it as best as we can. But yeah, I, I, I mean, I speak to Cotts still now. I always, always had a great relationship with Cotts. He was a fantastic football player. He had so much quality. And obviously he spoke about his situations with his mental health. But mm. it's great to see the way that he's given up drink, um, the things he's doing with his foundation. Yeah, it's people go through them situations that you have to go through dark times sometimes to realise what, what, what life's all about. And Cots has come out of that side now and he's now on the up, which is great seeing that. How hard is leadership when you're not in the team or the starting eleven? Is that a challenge in, in terms of you personally, because you're very determined and driven? Can that be a challenge in terms of your your role and responsibility within the dressing room if you're not in the starting lineup? No, because my roles and responsibilities don't change. I'm I'm the leader. I'm the captain. So I have to do exactly the same if I'm not playing or if mm. I'm injured, if I'm suspended. My my roles won't won't change from I've got to be in the dressing room. I've got to, I've got to support the lads. I've got to help them. I've got to guide them. But also, it's not about just the players as well. It's about the families. So are the families settling and they got kids? How are they getting on? It's everything. As a leader, you've got to you've got to manage the dressing room. So it's not just the players; it's their families as well in how they're settling in the area if they yeah. if they've moved. So yeah, for me, it's. An important role is being a captain is not just on the football pitch, it's off it as well. What was your relationship like with the managers that you, you've you played under? Obviously, Gary Rowett, you, you're yeah. with Millwall at the moment. Was there yeah. anyone that stood out in terms of their leadership um, and how you obviously worked alongside that person in terms of your responsibility in the dressing room, etc.? I think Graham Taylor was, like I've mentioned before, was massive for me because he was the England manager. He came into Watford, he came back to Watford and he took us on two promotions and I think seeing what he'd done and, and the pressures that he had to deal with. And it was disgusting the way he was treated by, by the media, being England manager. Yeah. Um, 
And how we dealt with that was, I don't know how we dealt with it. All of that scrutiny and every paper had turned, it was Graham Taylor on the front of it, being disrespectful, his family had to read it. So learning things off him and the leaderships that, that he drove me to, again, always puts you in good stead. I think Brian Robson as well, when I was at West Brom, he was a motivational manager. He was captain of Man United. He was captain of England. So how can you not pick the brains of, of men like that? And 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 how can they make you as well then a great leader because he's been a captain? So you always always seeing things that they were doing. It's like now with, with Gary, it's obviously I'll see different things that I'll go, oh, yeah, I like that. I'll take that on board. That'd be good for me later on in, in like, if I go on to be a manager one day, then I can use them bits and pieces. So you always learn. I think you always learn off every manager because every manager is different. Even even the foreign managers I work with, like Viali and, and Zola, and they, they always were something different. I mean, the Italians, obviously, I've got a bit of Italian in me, so that's probably where I get the fieriness from. But <laughs> they have a different way of doing things. It's For them, it's like it's that structure. It's demand, demand, demand. And you see... And you see why the Italians are so good. Obviously, they've not made the World Cup. But over the years, they're winners. They've won. That's why. It's because they're drilled. They're motivated. They're winners. They they demand 100%. So, yeah, it's I've, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot over the years, and it's been great for me. But also, I know I've got to understand I've got to be myself. I can't, I can't be like them. I've got to bring on what got me to where I got to and pass that information on and, and sort of guide it my way with how I want it or explain it in a way that I know that the lads are going to pick up on it the same way. Do you ever see yourself coaching abroad? Um, I don't know. Opportunities mm. are always out there. You you never know, do you? You never say never. I think if, if an opportunity was given to you that you had the possibility of going abroad, then it would, again, it would be a family decision because my family is really important to me. I'm a family man um, and my wife and kids we all sit down and we all have these discussions. So if I was going to go, then they'd, they'd have to come with me. But if it was a tough decision and they didn't want to go, then obviously I would make that decision what's best for me and my family. So in terms of your relationship with Gary Rowett now, what key qualities does he have in terms of leadership within football? What are some of the, the key aspects that I think um, he brings to the table in terms of his his career and his experiences with yourself at the moment? I think his years of experience, like the communication, the talking, the mentality is what he wants. His, his drills, he's like how he programs the team to play. It's watching, right? This is how I want you to line up. This is how I want you to do it. So you're always you're always picking things up all, every day, not even like little sessions when you're going through stuff. It's, well, what about this? Right, we need to change this because the opposition team might do that. So it's, yeah, we're always working on stuff and it's good because you can say something and he'll go, hey, I like that. And then he'll say something and I'll go, yeah, I like that. We, how can we work it where we're doing that in the training session? So you're always picking up things. But with the gaffer, he's, they say he's managed he's managed great clubs. So you you know that for a fact that you're always going to pick up good things. So it's understanding it. It's But then it's like you say, when you're, when you're doing it and it's when it's your turn to, you have to deliver it. You have to deliver it in the right way that the players understand it. And what kind of things do you look to use as a leader with a certain practice to to get the best out of the people that you work with is there any things that, that you think are relevant i think communication is massive i think you've got to talk you've got to explain so ex ex explanations if a player don't quite understand it then you've not only you've got to show them but you've got to show like you've got to do it yourself so you've got to show them how you want them to do it so again it's like a, it's like a demonstration for them right well i want you here but i want you to do this and then the players then they're like, oh, yeah, OK, right, I know how to do that. But for me, the biggest thing is communication. You've got to be able to talk to the players. You've got to motivate them. You've got to, Also, you've got to demand. If the players are not giving their all in the training, they're going to take that into the game. So for me, is you train how you play. That was always my mentality as well is, right, if my training's not good enough today, I'm going to play like that in the game, the next game that's coming up, because I'm not doing it right. I'm not listening to what's being explained to me. So I know... I need to be switched on. I need to be fully focused. And when I cross that white line, the manager or the coach is not shouting on me to do this because he's already explained to me in the training session of what I needed to do. So, uh, yeah, I think I think communication is massive. And that might even be if a player is making mistakes and he's doing things wrong, it's having a conversation with him and going through it and then working on it in the training ground. Right, well, I want you to work on this. So we're going to go through this and we're going to go over there now and... and 
do certain certain drills, certain situations of that will be a game related incident that's happened, and we're we'll, we're going to go through it and we're going to do it again against like the under twenty ones or or another player in the first team that I know that will test him. Just to add a layer to that, so you said communication. Do you think being authentic is important as well? Yeah, of course that, it is. That process? Yeah, you've yeah. got to. You've got to be authentic. You've got to be true to yourself. You've got to give the player the best possibility of being himself and being the best possible him that you know. I, I can't I can't kick the ball for him. That's I can't do that for him. So when he, I need to give him information, knowing that you're a top player. So I'm going to give you this little bit of information and then you now have got to do that. You've got to deliver it. So authenticity is massive. Be yourself. Have you ever come across the work of uh, Von Goffman? He mentions that all humans are actors and we put on different faces within different um, situations. Have you ever ever come across that work? I've I've come across it a little bit, yeah. Do you you ever put on faces within your profession at the moment? Do you maybe act in a certain way to get the best out of people or do you ever show people maybe the cold shoulder or different approaches within your profession? Sometimes because, (laughs) like you say, it's... Is a, is a mutual respect. You've got, like, if I'm giving you everything that I want you to do and want you to go on, you've got to give back the same. So you've got to be working hard for that. You've got to show me that you're you're actually wanting to do it. So if there's times where I feel like, you know what, I'm going to leave you for a little bit. I'm going to give you, the, I'm not going to give you that time and day. I'm not going to give you the extra training because we've worked on it and I'm going to make you spew a little bit and I'm going to see if you come back to me and go, Robbo, why are we not working on this? I was going to go, well, it's taking you two weeks to come back and ask me. So you you, you have to. Because you can't always give one person your time and your effort. It's a team. It's a team game. You have to give every player the best possible advice, the best possible opportunity to go out and perform to the highest level. How do you deal with conflict within a team? Knock them out. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you have to let that happen. Conflict. You've got to, you, you have to be able to deal with, if you're not doing your job properly, you have to tell him. You like, me as a coach, I'll tell them. But as a player sometimes and a player, you have to get it off your chest with, if you're not in the right position and we've worked on that in training, you as a player have got to tell him, we've worked on this. Like, come on, switch on, do your job. Because you're letting that you're letting your teammate down now. And if you're not covering your teammate when you know that he's just messed up and you're not there to help him out, I want to know, yeah, I made the mistake, but where was you? Why was you not covering me? Why was you not in that position to help me out? So conflict for me is good if it's, if it's like, if it's a good conflict, if it starts getting a negative or angry, then that's when you step in and you go, no, we're not, we're not doing that. That's not how we work. That's not how we do it. It has to be coming from a good, good vibe. Got, it's got to be coming from a good place when you're, when you're explaining it. Yeah. Would you say you're very much to the point then in terms of your communication style or do you find yeah. yourself using different methods mm-hmm. to deal with different personalities, different ways of... With different personalities you have to, yeah. you have to, the character that you're dealing with you have to find a different way of dealing with it. That, and, mm. and that's the way it is. But sometimes you do have to go brutal. You've got to go mm. hard in and say, look, this is how we're doing it. This has got to be doing it like that. So do it. Mm. If they can't well, do it, unfortunately, they're the ones who miss out. But you know that they will do it because then they'll get their head down and they'll work harder because you know yeah. that they can do it, but you're challenging them. What, what about ego, Paul? People with coming into a football club, maybe on high salaries and have a bit of an ego, egotistical nature of, of football. How, how do you deal with maybe those personalities, maybe as a player or, or even as a coach? Um, gradually knock it out of them because you're a teammate now. You, we've, we've got to stick together as one. Uh, to, don't worry about the money. For me, I'm not. Players earn what they earn because they've been given that. that that's not your choice. You can't, yeah. you can't do that. You, you, only, you only deal with what you're earning and now you're getting on with your job. My job was always, I want to play at the highest level for as long as I can. So if I've got someone in my team that's actually not doing the running around for me, I'm going to knock you, I'm going to knock you down and I'm going to, I'm going to take that out of you in training. As a player, I'll be like, no, we're all in this together. You're not bigger than us. You're no better than us. You're not bigger than the club. So you're here now at this football club because of where you're at in your career. So you do what everyone else is doing. And we all stay on that level page, that line, don't cross the line. And if we all do it together, we'll get on. We'll go really far. All, the best teams that I played for were the honest, were the most honest teams. The, they were the ones who dug each other out when they needed to dig each other out, helped each other on and off the pitch, 
and also work the socks off for each other. And they demanded. That was they were the best teams. I then that was like your Watford's, your West Brom's, four promotions with with two of them teams. And there was no big names in the teams. It was pure hard workers and dedication to doing the job to the best ability. Was was it that in terms of maybe coach giving autonomy to players to to take responsibility, or was there a little bit of a, a balance? I'm just intrigued to to kind of find out yeah, the cultural give, aspect there. You got to give players the license. So as players, as coaches, you have to give them the license to find their feet. But you've also you've got to you've got to appreciate that the changing room's got to control that that changing room. And them lads that are in there have got to control them ego. So they've got to deal with whatever's coming. So if they feel that that player's doing totally the opposite of what they want to do, then you've got to tell them. You've got to deal with that. As a coach, we deal with it. We deal with, like, if there's a situation where we're not happy with certain things, we'll sit and analyse it and we'll go, well, I'm not happy with that. So what am I going to do about it? I'm, do you know what? I'm going to pull him. I'm going to work on the training ground. Do you want to work on that? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going on the track. We're doing 15, 20 minutes extra. And we're going to work on that. I'm not going to leave him. I'm not going to let him suffer. I'm going to make him work and make him better and improve him and put him in a good, put him in that good mindset, knowing that he's going to now feel a million dollars because he's been given the information, but we've also worked on it as well. Mm-hmm. So you you have to, again, it's all about balance. You've got to find the balance and you've got to deal with the characters because there's always different characters. But I always feel that the manager has to deal with a lot. The manager always has to deal with everything. He has to deal with the, the negativity that comes from fans. He has to deal with the media that will ask him shit, like questions. He has to deal with the players who are not happy or not playing. But as a captain, as a, you have to take responsibility for that dressing room. The manager doesn't see what goes on behind closed doors. So you have to manage that as a group and you have to keep it in order. Is We don't do that here. This is what we're all about. And then when you're on the training ground, then as coaches, we have to manage that. That That's now our group where we have to take control of it. And we have to feel if there's players that are stepping out of line, not doing it, they get told. Just, just to add on to what you've just answered. So in terms of maybe cultural aspects, positive cultural uh, factors. Yeah, positive. Um, in terms yeah, of, you yeah. Can't, yeah, you've got to. You've got to, make it, you've got to make it positive. It's got to come from a good place of where you're doing it. If you're doing it angrily and negatively, you lose that player straight away. You lose a coach straight away. If you're talking to a coach that way, I don't want to work with him. I don't like the what I don't like what he's saying. I don't I don't agree with what he's saying. But if he'd have spoke to me in a certain way and dealt with it better, then brilliant. But like we can we can move on and we can we can get to where we want to get to together then as a group. But yeah, you you've got to do it from a good place. You have to. Mm. What does the future of leadership in football look like then? So you mentioned different generations, different types of football players. Yeah, different ways of learning, developing. What do you yeah, think well, the future yeah. of leadership look like? Looks I think, like. Yeah, I think you're hoping, you're hoping that the mentors and the people that of the game, or the coaches of the game, that can pass that on, keep it going. Because that's what you have to do. You have to keep passing it on. That next generation will look up and they get inspired. Right. Well, I'm passing it on to you now. You have to take control of it. So now you're passing it on to that generation that's below you. You always have to keep passing on the information, the mindset, the emotions, the shoulder to cry on, the arm around the shoulder to help you out. There's, there's, there's so many things. There's so many things that we always can be moving forward in passing that information on to help others. And then they've got to do that. They've got to keep it going. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think like you say, it's always, we look at, obviously when you go back to now watching England with the golden generation, like your Beckhams, your Ferdinands, your Gerrards, your Scholeses, We've got that now. We, we've probably got a better opportunity in winning something with this generation. But are we going to call that the golden generation? Because we had that. But for me now, we've, got a, we've got, probably got the most exciting attacking players to go out and use, but we don't use them. We're so negative. We're so defensive. And it's, well, they do it for their clubs, but why are they not doing it for their country? That's, mm-hmm. again, we're passing it on. So you're passing it on now. That generation's coming through. So I'm looking at the exciting times that England are. So that that next group of players that's coming through are looking at them and going, well, I want to take your spot. I want to do that now. I want to go on and inspire and younger kids and pass that on and look at the way that I'm playing and things like that. My, my, my kids watch certain players and they're like, oh, I love that. I love what he does. Well, go on then. Do it. Go and achieve it. If you think that you can do it, go on and do it. Be positive about it and learn from it and work on it. Well, you mentioned the fact that 
the golden generation and the players that we have in the England team now and obviously the elite players performance plan has been built over a, n- a number of years um, do you think we need to maybe change our outlook towards the national team and actually honour the fact that we can actually go and win something and, and be achievable within major competitions yeah we can we can do that but like you say it's but Gareth I mean for me Gareth's done a great job I think he's done a great job. He's taken us to a, to a final. He's he's taken us to a semi final. So there's progression now. We're getting somewhere. It's but this next generation now, they could win it. They could win the World Cup if they believed in themselves and they played as a team and they defended as a team. Then, for without a shadow of a doubt, they could they could go on and win it with what they're doing. So for me now, we are moving forward because we're getting to finals. We're getting to semi finals. So we're, we're, we're moving in the right direction, but it's carrying on. That next step now is winning it. We've just got to look at the women. If we watch the women's Euros, they've inspired, they've inspired us as a nation. They've won it. They've won the Euros. So now as men, don't feel the pressure. Go and do it because we know you can do it. Just mm. sometimes you've got to, like, because of the intensity and the pressure that's on our, our players, it's like we get to a point and we stutter. We always get to that certain point. And I think Gareth's the same. I think if he just releases, relaxes, and has people around him that go, do you know what, Gaff, um, Gaffer, like, let this player go and unleash himself. Because if I'm looking at a Saka and I'm looking at a Grealish with what they're doing with their clubs at the moment, I'm thinking, oh my God, they are going to cause so many problems for like international teams that we're going to come up against in the World Cup. It would be, it would be ridiculous. But you've got to give them that license to go and do that. But you've also got to tell your defenders just defend, because mm-hmm. I see. Like Trent's a great example. He's a great example. And I think Gary Neville's assessment of it was spot on last night with yeah. how we are, how he sees a modern day fullback now is to how he was as a fullback. He got that guidance. He got that help with his positioning, with his body position, checking his shoulders. Trent is one of the best fullbacks in the world with going forward and attacking. But defensively, he's, he gets caught out all the time because he defensively is not switched on. But if you work on them four areas that Gary talked about, he is a well, he's, he's the world's best right back in the world. Mm. It's the same with Juan Bissaka. When I watch him, he frustrates the life out of me. I I look at the TV and I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you going there? Because he's, he's not thinking straight. He's not doing what he's programmed to do. You you do, you watch fullbacks all the time and you're why, why are you doing that? Is we, we have got the, like Luke Shaw left back, Ben Chilwell left back. What a squad we've got. But they don't get picked. They, they don't get picked for the like Luke Shaw gets picked because, and he's not playing. Ben Chilwell's not playing at Chelsea, but he's had more game time than Luke Shaw. So there's that balance. And you know for a fact that they're going to go in and they're going to do a good job because they're mm-hmm. no. Just on that element, you mentioned Trent then, and, and we can try and relate this to yourself a little bit in terms of maybe going against teams that are um, have a lot of possession. Mm. Um, concentration within football. Mm. How Absolutely. how do you work on that? And I, I can imagine that's such a massive um, skill to utilise from a psychological point of view. Um, can that be trained? Can that be worked upon? Like what, what kind of maybe systems or strategies do you use to to, to kind of ensure that? You stay concentrated and, and focused and disciplined. You've got to stay concentrated. You've got to stay concentrated for the whole 90 odd minutes. Yeah. It's impossible because there's always distractions, but there's always changes in games where a different player will come on and he'll have something different. So you've now got to think of di- like different scenarios that are going to happen now when new players come on the pitch. But when you when you're looking at like someone like a Trent, he doesn't he just literally doesn't switch on defensively. That's yeah. his letdown, is that he's not aware of what's around him. As a defender, you have to be. Otherwise, you're conceding goals left, right and centre. And it is. It's probably this Liverpool side now are conceding more goals than they ever had because you're looking at your Van Dykes now. He's getting exposed. Your Robertsons, when he's in playing, he's been getting exposed. They weren't getting exposed two years ago. They were at the top of their game and no one was no one was getting past them defensively, but an attacking sense as well. They were the most dangerous fullbacks in, in the world at what they were doing. So it's... It's just phases of it's phases of the game and life. And as a player, you go through periods where it doesn't happen for the whole 90 minutes. But that's where that concentration, that's where you go back to the basics of why was I doing that before? Why was I such a top fullback? Right. Well, 
I know that the manager wants me to bomb on and he wants me to do this, but I'm actually getting exposed now and I'm not doing this. So sometimes during the game, you've got to have that mindset of, well, I need to do this first before then, but then that will come. As the game goes on, I know that I've done my job there and now I know I can concentrate on the best parts of my game, which is that de delivery or that quality. So 1v1 for me, in my head, you're not getting the better of me. You ain't mm. beating me. I'm going to get in your head where I'm beating you even before we're even kicking the ball. I'm going to get in your head. I'm going to say something. I'm going to put you off. I'm going to distract you. So I'm always working on the player first before a ball's even kicked to see what he's like, what's his mentality like. If I know then, right, I'm not getting in his head. So I know I'm not going to. So I need to get in his head now when I'm on the football pitch and that's, you ain't beating me. And then when, when I am beating you defensively and I've got the better of you because you're not getting past me, I am now going to run you that way and you've got to defend. So I'm going to outrun you now and take you the other way. And that's how you do it. That's, but that's, again, that's, that's the style of play, though. That's, that, that was me as a person. That's how I work. With Trent, he's in a team that is expansive. They play attacking, high press, get the balls forward, like get in areas, Trent, where you're delivering the balls into them strikers. That's, it. that's what he does. That's what he does best. But, but now what's getting highlighted is he's actually getting highlighted for just the basic stuff which is defending. Who's the most challenging opponent you've ever played against? Um, well, there's David Beckham, Ronaldo, just them, them type of wingers that Joe Cole, Ian Robin, they were all different types of wingers who always had different ways. Sean White Phillips. So you never, you never knew what they were going to do, but you always just had to concentrate on your game. Right. Like, how am I going to, how am I going to outsmart them? How am I going to, how am I going to beat them mentally knowing that, they're not getting the better of me today. And that was the challenge. That was the challenge was to try and outsmart them. But yeah, with someone like Ronaldo, you you had you had to you had to work extremely hard just because he was so good at what he did. Did did those strategies work in terms of getting in their head? No. <laughs> not, not, not with Ronaldo. That's why he's the world's best player. That's why he's been yeah. the player he has been for for so long, because he's He's got that mentality. He's got that mindset of I'm being the best at what I'm what I'm doing. So last question, Paul. So what I always get my guests to do is to look back on when they first started their yes. footballing career. So if you were to go back, you mentioned Watford and got, yeah. went back to that period when you began your career. If you could change one thing or if you could do one thing again, what would it be? Um, to be more to be more focused. I think if I if I was more focused, I I believe that I could have possibly played for England a lot more than what I did. Well, didn't I under twenty ones I only played for. But I believe that I could have had the opportunity to play for England, yeah. Is that a bit of a, a regret looking back? No, 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 I don't regret. I don't regret anything, my career, because I had I had an unbelievable career um for twenty two years. So I have no regrets because it was my choices, it was my decisions. So you can't you can't have any regrets. But yeah, I just think now if I was going back to my younger self now, it'd be that more focus, um, just be more concentrated on what was what the information that was being passed on to me. Paul, well, thank you so much for your time. Um, no where can we find you if, if listeners are uh, listening to this podcast or watching the visual podcast? Where can we find your details? Uh, I presume you're on social media. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, I'm on I'm on Instagram, Twitter. So I'm all on all on the social medias, um, Facebook. So yeah. Plastered all over there. Got the blue tick. <laughs> if you want to stay positive and have a good laugh, then yeah, follow me. Perfect. And uh, good luck with your fixture as well in the week. T tomorrow, yeah. Good game yeah. tomorrow against Rotherham, yeah. Good luck against Rotherham. Paul, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you very much, Christy. Good to speak to you, mate.